I'm pleased to announce that my first street photography book is now available for pre-orders over on my website. There is only 200 limited of this book and I already sent out a pre-order link to my newsletter subscribers first a couple of days ago and I already sold 60 copies on day one which is incredible. The support has been amazing. I'm a little bit taken aback to be fair. So by the time this video goes out, I'm sure there will still be some copies left but pre-order is now available and I'm aiming for end of November release. Everything's been completed on my part. They're being printed. My first street photography book will be out there in the ether for people to enjoy. If you're interested in pre-ordering a copy of my street photography book, then I will leave a link in the description. But that's probably enough about me. In this video, I wanted to share the photo books that have changed how I think about photography. I'm sure you've heard many photographers talk about the importance of photo books and I'm not here to sell you on the idea but to simply agree with the fact that photo books can have a crucial role on your photography and they have inspired me and my work for a long time now. A good photo book really gets you thinking about photography in a way that looking at images on a screen doesn't. Photography printed and sequenced and designed with intention and detail is photography on a whole other level. So as you can tell, I think photo books are pretty cool. So now let's share some examples of some books that I've enjoyed recently. The first book I wanna share with you is Autofocus, The Car in Photography. And I actually stumbled across this book in Waterstones and after a little flick through, I realized that it had been 30 minutes and I was still stood there reading it. So at that point, I realized I should probably just buy it and take it home. This book gets me thinking, and it's not about cars, but about the environment in our photographs and how the details we might not consider important actually affect the overall image. The car is obviously one of the biggest inventions of modern times. It's reshaped cities, landscapes, culture, the economy. But this book doesn't focus on car photography per se. It is actually just about photographs that include cars. On the back of the book, it says, this book is not about cars or even photographs of cars. This book is about photographs with cars in them. From the celebratory to the surreal, autofocus the car in photography explores the many intersections between car and camera. I like the text in bold on the back, which also says, cars are a ubiquitous aspect of modern life, yet sometimes it takes a photographer's eye to make them visible. This book is full of different projects from a range of different world-class photographers over the last 100 years or so. And it gives you an insight into how these photographers have used the car to help tell different stories. This image right here is one of my favorites in the book and I think represents uh, why I like it so much. Very famous image from Robert Frank. And I'll just quickly skim through this caption at the side. Through his camera's viewfinder, Frank aligned a number of seemingly unrelated elements of this foggy London street scene into a coherent picture. In the foreground, the open door of a hearse frames the grainy form of a rubbish collector. While on the opposite side of the road, a running child is reflected in the wet pavement. The solid black bulk of the vehicle stands out against the soft greys of the row of houses, which fade almost to white as they are swallowed by the fog. One of the reasons I love this image is not only because the hearse looks good, yes, compositionally it's nice, we've got the black, contrast the white. This is a photograph not about the hearse. The hearse just features in the photograph to amplify it. And a lot of the photos in this book follow this theme. It's not about the car, it's about how the car affects the image. And I find that really interesting. Here is another interesting image from the book. This is essentially a self-portrait. Um, and the reason we know it's a self-portrait is this person's tied up here in what kind of looks like a sleeping bag, but you can see the wire connected to the camera here, which obviously suggests it's a self-portrait, but it's such a funny, I don't know if funny is the word, I think it's quite funny, but you can see the wheels of the car that's covered up, but you can also see the person's feet as they're covered up. Obviously this is intentional, but it's an interesting image that's not about the car. The car plays a bigger role in this fascinating self-portrait. It could be from reading books like this or a natural progression in my photography or probably a mix of both that I now pretty much always consider the details around my subjects that could possibly play a role in adding story and context. And I don't mean just for compositions. Placing this over here or making shapes with that object over there, but actually how the small details overall in the image can kind of complete it. For the examples in this book, we are focused on the subject, which isn't the car a lot of the time. But the natural and casual way that the car makes its way into the composition 
just helps us further understand more about the photograph. The next book I want to talk about is All That Life Can Afford by Matt Stewart. So I only recently picked up this book about three weeks ago, but I'd seen most of the photographs in this book online over the years. When I first discovered Matt's work in 2020, I watched and looked at as much as possible, but I've been waiting to get my hands on this book specifically. And um, yeah, obviously looking at photos online just doesn't have the impact that it does when you sit down with it in front of you. There are two versions of this book. In 2016, Matt published a red cover and a gray cover as the first edition. And then in 2020, he resequenced the book, gave it a new design, took out some photos, and that is the second edition also came as a red cover and a gray cover versions. I wanted the red cover version, first edition, because I think it's the nicest looking and there are more photographs in here compared to the 2020 edition. And because the 2020 edition, the second edition is more readily available online, that just made me want this copy more. So I've been waiting to get my hands on this one for a while and I saw it came online for sale three weeks ago and yeah so i finally have my hands on matt stewart's all that life can afford matt essentially features the everyday quirks and unexpected moments of life in london over a period of about 13 years something i love about this type of street photography is that a lot of the moments and details we see especially in this book wouldn't inherently be interesting if they were individual moments but as soon as you turn it into a photograph and decide what elements to include, what elements not to include, and just the composition as a whole, then it becomes really interesting. And I think that's a skill set in street photography, to be able to take the mundane or multiple mundane things and bring them all together into a cohesive image. And Matt does that fantastically in this book. Look at this one, for example, the back of the truck and the Houses of Parliament, two separate subjects existing in their own way, but compose the two together so the cones almost match the towers combined with the words management systems, the scene has a whole new meaning to it. Those two separate subjects now work wonderfully together. This one here is absolutely one of my favorite street photographs. What are the chances of these two random things working so brilliantly for a split second? And then being there at the right time at the right place to get the image, it's almost impossible, right? And this kind of playful, witty street photography is so much fun to try. It's incredibly hard to do. Um, you almost can never do it. It's very difficult, but the photos in this book kind of remind you that it's all a perspective. And just by adding a funny perspective or changing the way you think about certain things in a frame and kind of bringing them together, you can create a whole new story. And this book is such a joy to, to flick through and it always makes me smile, even though I've seen most of the photos a lot of times. Another thing to add is that this book doesn't just celebrate the spontaneity and the quirks of life in the street, but somehow Matt has made central London look colourful. When a lot of people think of London, it's grey, it's dark and mostly cold, but there's a really nice use of colour and energy in this book. It's definitely a feel-good read kind of book and it always encourages me to go outside. The next book I want to share is The A1, The Great North Road by Paul Graham. This was originally published in 1983 and then republished 40 years later with a couple of things added, like a foreword, for example, and this is the copy I managed to get my hands on last year. I will quickly read some words on the back so you have some context to this project because I find it incredibly interesting. The A1 travels from the Bank of England in the very centre of London up through the industrial Midlands, North East England and the East Coast of Scotland to finish in Princess Street, Edinburgh. The 400 mile route was the busiest road in the country and quickly became known as the Great North Road, a title it aptly deserved until the late 1950s when it was usurped by the fast and efficient motorway system, which left the A1 in a state of atrophy underused and decaying. This book is a mix of landscapes, portraits, interiors, still life. It covers the broader idea of social documentary, and it seems like whatever Paul noticed on his travels that caught his eye, he was able to share how those moments looked, but also how they felt. Although the A1 in this book is still a main road of sorts, it's still a busy road that lorry drivers and workers and passers-by will use, the images that share interiors of cafes and petrol stations they, they feel kind of off, like the photos represent a space in between. 
these places are not the destination necessarily for anyone. And I don't know if liminal space is the correct word to use, but, and maybe I'm feeling a certain type of way about the images because I wasn't around then. So I only have an idea of what the 80s looked like, but these photos definitely have an atmosphere to them. The photos definitely make me feel something. All the photos in this book were taken with a full frame camera. So that gives you an idea of the type of equipment Paul was lugging around with him to get these photographs. And something else I find interesting is that all of the portraits in this book were posed, they were staged, they were agreed upon portraits, except for the very first image in the book. This was taken outside the Bank of England. And in this scene, we see some city professionals and a woman in a blue coat working wonderfully with the blue tie flipped over the guy's arm. Not only is this a really good image regardless, but I cannot imagine setting up a large format camera on a tripod on a busy street at the Bank of England and still managing to get this candid photo. I think it's a brilliant image to start the book. There is a fantastic video on the Louisiana YouTube channel that is basically just an interview with Paul Graham about his work. And that's how I discovered Paul Graham as a photographer. So I'll leave a link for you to watch that. I definitely recommend. I wanted to add a section here at the end of the video, quick fire, some bonus books that I recommend that are not just photography related, but creativity as a whole. So this one by uh, Austin Cologne, still like an artist, 10 things nobody told you about being creative. This is incredibly practical and real and down to worth and easy to read. It's all about the idea that not everything is or nothing is original and everything comes from inspiration from somewhere. Um, yeah, very, honest book and practical. You can take things from this and it's very relatable. Anyone making anything or thinking about making anything, get this book and read it. Rick Rubin's The Creative Act is one of the most interesting books I've read in a long time and I honestly think every creative person should read it. And this has blown up this year. You've probably seen other people share it. And for good reason, this book articulates a lot of the thoughts and concerns that you might already have if you're busy making things, if you're someone that is working as a creative or you're someone that is passionate about creative stuff, you will resonate with a lot of what's said in this book. This says, thoughts and habits not conducive to the work. And then there is just bullet points, just straight up facts for you to read that you should be avoiding or at least thoughts you should be avoiding. Let me just read off a couple of them. Believing you're not good enough, feeling you don't have the energy it takes, mistaking adopted rules for absolute truths, not wanting to do the work, laziness, not taking the work to the highest expression, settling, having goals so ambitious that you can't begin, thinking you can only do your best work in certain conditions, requiring specific tools or equipment to do the work, photographers, thinking that you need certain gear, that's what that is, having too many ideas and not knowing where to start, never finishing projects, blaming circumstances, etc. Etc. Et Great list of things you shouldn't be doing that are not conducive to the work. Yesterday I was getting the books ready to film this video and I dropped a little bit of water on it and actually smudged the cover. So I guess this is a limited edition now. And my final recommendation for this video is The Frame Lines magazine by Shane Taylor and Josh Edgus. This is a quarterly street photography magazine. And I don't know about you, but I don't consume much street photography apart from in books. I don't really consume it on Instagram, for example, anymore that much. I go on Instagram to check my DMs and check my stories, see, see what people are up to. And YouTube, I like photography on YouTube, but as well as books, it's nice to have a somewhat regular magazine that feels quite current. Uh, Shane and Josh do a great job at putting their work together for this. It features interviews with other photographers, some that you will know, some that you won't know. I've been introduced to many photographers via the Frame Lines magazine, so I've got, I've got that to thank them for. I just, yeah, like I said, I'm happy this exists. There is six editions of the Frame Lines mag and I've, I've picked up four, I think. So I like to get it when I can. I think you should all check out the Frame Lines magazine if you haven't, along with the other books I've recommended in this video. But yeah, a little plug to Shane Taylor and Josh Edgoos. I think what they're doing here is fantastic. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this photo book conversation, I've never made a video about photo books before. So if this is received well, then maybe we can turn this into a somewhat regular thing. I've got a little collection of photo books, so each video we could go through two or three and share my thoughts and whatever. Also, you can now pre-order my street photography book. I don't know how long they will be available for. I mean, fingers crossed it sells out. Wouldn't that be a dream? There is only 200 copies. Uh, so if you're watching this video in a few months time, there might not be any left. 
unless there is loads of them left and you're now watching this video a year later and I haven't sold any more, then that would be a little bit depressing, wouldn't it? But anyway, uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next week. Peace.